Um, so a lot of the talks today are about um, early phase development. Um, but today I'm going to take you towards the other end of the spectrum and talk about what happens right at the end um, when you're looking at health technology assessment, so trying to decide if your product is value for money or not. Um, I've worked, as Vivian said, for 15 years in the pharmaceutical industry across all phases of development and um, actually quite recently I worked in early clinical development and there are there is one big parallel between health technology assessment and early clinical development, and that is the use of modeling and simulation. Because when you're looking at the cost effectiveness of a product, you need to evaluate that over a lifetime horizon in a real world setting. But often all that you have is the data from the clinical trials, so modeling and simulation becomes very important. And today I'm going to talk to you about a particular technique which is used very often in health technology assessment, but can equally be applied um, in other settings as well, and that's adjusting overall survival for treatment switch. And it's a summary really of some of the recommendations that have come out of a working group that I lead, um, and I'll talk to you about that a bit more in a minute. So the outline of the talk, I'll introduce you to the group that have been working on this, give you a bit of the background to treatment switching, why it's important, why it's particularly important for health technology assessment. Um, go, spend a fair bit of time looking at the different methods, and there, there are plenty of methods out there. Some are quite simple or naive, some are quite complex, um, but there's, there's plenty of choice out there. And uh, give you an example as well, and then talk about how you might actually go about selecting those methods. And then finish up with some best practice on the design and analysis. So the working group I mentioned is a sub-team of the PSI Health Technology Assessment Special Interest Group. Um, PSI, as, as you probably know, is the UK uh, Professional Association for Pharmaceutical Industry Statisticians. And you can see from the, re from the members here, past and present, that we've had representation from many major pharmaceutical companies and also um, some additional support from Nick Latimer at the University of Sheffield. Um, and really, it's just people that have a general interest in treatment switching methods. We get together. We talk about recent developments and we try and um, publicize what's going on in this area and, and help um, develop the research in those methods further. So the points I'm going to talk to you about really come from two key publications plus um, some reflections from my own personal experience of fitting these models. Um, the first is, is this one here from Pharmaceutical Statistics. Uh, it's a publication that the working group put out. It was published, I think, end of 2013 um, in pharmaceutical statistics. And at the time, most of the papers discussing treatment switching were fairly uh, methodolo methodology-based. Um, they weren't particularly focusing on the practical aspects of doing this. And they tended to talk about methods in isolation. They didn't bring them all together into one place. Um, but about six months after that, um, NICE, the UK Health Technology Assessment Group, um, their, their decision support unit published a technical support document um, which was authored by Nick Latimer and Keith Abrams. Um, so Nick is a, a co-author on both of those two publications, so uh, there is some commonality in there. So I'll talk about some of the points from those papers. Um, but first of all, some definitions. So what do we mean by treatment switch? Uh, some people call it treatment crossover. It's a little bit confusing sometimes because it's, it, it's different to crossover trials. Treatment switch only happens in parallel group trials. So in general, we prefer to call it treatment switch rather than crossover. But it's essentially when patients are going across to the alternative treatment arm at some point before an endpoint of interest occurs, usually overall survival. And it comes in two forms. You can either have treatment switch built into the protocol um, where it's, it's written that upon disease progression, uh, patients will then cross over and get the alternative treatment. This often happens in a placebo-controlled trial where there may be arguments that it's unethical to withhold active treatment from patients. Um, and a very commonly quoted example of this is, is a sinitinib trial in gastro, gastrointestinal stromal tumours uh, where patients were initially randomised to sinitinib or placebo and then all the placebo patients were offered sinitinib upon progression. Um, alternatively, it can also happen spontaneously. So even if you haven't put it in your protocol, patients still may 
get the treatment through some other means. So in this example here, which is Gefitinib or Eressa in non-small cell lung cancer, um, it was a first-line trial against doublet chemotherapy, um, but Eressa and some similar drugs in the class were approved as second-line treatments in some countries. So a lot of patients went on to get Eressa as a second-line treatment. Um, and this also can happen even in quite a new um, area because if there are a lot of clinical trials going on with similar agents, pa patients may get later line therapy through a different clinical trial. And I guess the impact of this is fairly obvious, but just an illustration here. So this is um, an evaluation of trials in non-small cell lung cancer that was uh, published in 2013. Um, and it just looks at the link between the hazard ratios for progression-free survival, which should be unaffected by switch, and overall survival, which may be affected by switch. And you can see in the trials where switch was prohibited, there was a stronger relationship between those than in the trials where switch was not allowed. Um, of course, this is just correlation, it's not causation, um, but nevertheless, it fits with what we may expect. Yes, I, th I think ethically you cannot, I guess maybe prohibited isn't the correct word to use. You can't prohibit switch because if, if the treatment is available and the, the patient and the investigator want to give it, you can't prohibit. But um, I, I guess it was perhaps trials where it wasn't built into the protocol. In. They, they said prohibited was the word they used in that publication, but I think it was more where it wasn't built into the trial and they weren't able to get it in another way. So I think before thinking about the methods and how you might want to adjust for treatment switch, it's important to understand the customer that you may be using these analyses for because regulatory agencies and health technology, uh, health technology assessment agencies have very different viewpoints. Regulators are interested in evaluating efficacy in a clinical trial. Um, and you know that switch has happened as part of the clinical trial. So for the primary analysis, they would like you to use intention to treat and to not adjust to remove that switch. They may consider switch-adjusted survival analyses as a sensitivity analysis. Five years ago, I would say maybe not so much, but they are coming around to the idea now. You know, I've seen examples where the EMA has asked a company to go and do some of these switch-adjusted analyses. Um, but also, the primary endpoint may not be survival anyway. Very often, trials are approved on the basis of significant PFS um, with a trend in overall survival. Um, so they're less, less concerned about the impact of switching as long as your survival is going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, usually, this is done when primary endpoint is, say, like PFS, um, but it happened for the OS, overall survival. Have you seen any example that adjusted uh, analysis being used in the label? Being used? In the label. In a label. I've, I've seen it being mentioned in an EPA. Um, I don't know about a label. I've not seen any of those, not from a regulatory perspective. But, uh, Um, health technology assessment agencies have a different viewpoint on this because, as I mentioned earlier, they are looking at effectiveness in a real-world setting. And the switch that's happened in the trial, for the most part, won't represent what would happen in the real world. Um, so they may consider using plausible methods to adjust for the switch. And I'll put a little asterisk next to the plausible methods because different agencies have different views of what methods are plausible. Um, and in particular, the German agency, ICWIG, GBA, doesn't really think any of them are plausible. So uh, it, it depends on the agency there. Um, if you can't find any plausible methods, then you have to resort to using the intention to treat analysis. Um, but the real reason why they are interested in this is because the key endpoint for lifetime cost effectiveness calculations is survival. That drives a lot of the cost, it drives a lot of the effectiveness. Um, so really, they want a, a good estimate of what the survival would be in a real-world setting over a lifetime horizon. Mm 
And the decision problem in health technology assessment is usually to compare the current clinical practice without the new therapy, which is represented by the control arm of a trial, uh, to the potential future clinical practice, including the new therapy, rep represented by the experimental arm of the trial. Um, and obviously, um, if they're switching, that doesn't represent clinical practice and the new therapy is effective, you're going to have an underestimate of your actual survival difference in real life. So you need to estimate the long-term efficacy without switch. How do we go about that? So there are lots of different methods available. Um, I'm going to talk about this in the context of overall survival in oncology trials, but there's no reason why it couldn't be applied to long-term time-to-event endpoints in any other disease area. Um, and I'm also only going to talk about simple switching where patients are going from the control arm to the experimental arm. You can get far more complicated situations, um, but I think for the, methods of, for the purpose of illustrating the methods, we'll just stick to, stick to something simple for now. So there are simple or naive methods which are easy to apply. Um, these include excluding censoring switches or including a time varying covariate for the switch. Um, but the problem with these is they tend to have high levels of bias. So to try and address that, um, several complex methods have been developed. They're hard, harder to apply, but they try to reduce that bias. Um, and they do have really nice, long, complicated to say names. They tend to be abbreviated. So inverse probability of censoring weighting, IPCWE. It's so essentially an observational, uses observational data methods. Rank preserving structural failure time is a, quite a different approach. Um, it's based on the randomization of the trial. Um, it's abbreviated RPSFT. Um, iterative parameter estimation is, is similar to rank preserving approach. Um, and there's also a two-stage model. These, these are the most common models that are used. There are other ones out there, um, but these are the ones that tend to be uh, used the most within health technology assessment, at least. And then finally, the use of external data. So rather than looking at adjusting your data within the trial to remove the effective switch, you can perhaps use something from outside of the trial. So what I'm going to do is go through each of these in turn, give a very brief overview, um, and, that, and then show you an example. So first of all, excluding switches. So obviously this is quite a, an obvious concept, but I just want to use it to illustrate, to, to introduce you to the diagram that I'm going to use to illustrate the other methods. Um, so this represents what's going on in the control arm. Um, patients live for a certain amount of time, they die or they're censored, and then some patients switch from the control arm to the experimental arm. And uh, this would be compared to the observed experimental arm. And obviously, when we exclude switches, it's very simple. You just take those switch patients out of the analysis. You compare the non-switches on the control arm to the entire experimental arm. Now, clearly, that's not a great approach because you're assuming by doing that that your switches and non-switches have the same prognosis. You can use the non-switches to represent what would have happened to the switches if they hadn't switched. And that hardly ever holds because the reason for switching is usually because patients have progressed. So they're clearly going to have a poorer prognosis than the patients that haven't switched. Um, another way of talking about this is saying there's no confounding variables. There's no variables that influence both the decision to switch and how long <coughs> patients live for. So simple concept. Censoring switches, again, a very familiar concept. Um, you simply take those patients and sense them at the point of switch. Um, but again, you're making the same assumption because you're using the patients that are not censored to represent the patients that are. It's, you're assuming a non-informative censoring. But it, it doesn't hold in this situation because the, they're censored due to progression. So actually, we end up with exactly the same assumption, exactly the same issue. An alternative approach is thinking about using a time-varying covariate um, for switch. Um, so you've got a covariate, I, I, I don't know, progression, for example, that influences survival in the non-switches. Within the switches, that progression also influences survival, but the fact you've had switch treatment is also influencing survival. Now, if this was just the case, if it was this simple, 
you would be okay to include the time variant covariate um, for switch. But actually, progression itself is influencing switch. So you, it's, it's not that simple. You can't just put those covariates in a model because there's, there's additional confounding um, between, between those things. So we, we've got the same issue in the end. So all of the naive methods have some problems, hence the development of the more complex ones. So the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, inverse probability of censoring weighting, IPCW. And the idea of this is that the, the times for which the patients are not switched have some weights applied to them. And those weights represent how switcher-like patients are at that point. So that the patients which are more switcher-like but haven't switched have more weight in the analysis. They're up-weighted to represent the patients that have switched and that have dropped out. And the key assumption in this is that the variables that are used for this weight calculation, um, they fully capture all of the reasons for switching that are also linked to survival. In other words, there's no unmeasured confounders. Everything that influences the decision to switch and survival is included in this weight calculation. And that's actually quite a difficult thing to do because you're talking about covariates that may be go on for a long time until the patient switches, until the patient dies. Something like, I don't know, performance status, quality of life, something like that. Um, and often we stop collecting the data at progression. So actually having all of this data in the weight calculation, all of the variables, often doesn't hold. So there's usually quite a lot of arguments about that assumption. And just to talk about that in a little bit more detail, it's, it's a two-stage approach really. In stage one, you look at the control arm patients and you model the probability of switch over time, conditional on their baseline and their time varying factors. Um, it's essentially using a propensity score. And out of that, you get time varying subject specific um, weights. And then you apply those in a survival analysis, a weighted survival analysis, and you come out with a weighted hazard ratio in Kaplan Meyer. So, one important thing to note from this is that you don't adjust individual patient times to remove the effect of switching. You just get an overall weighted hazard ratio in kaplan Meyer. So that can sometimes mean you have to take some special considerations later on if you're going to use that to do further modeling. Second complex method is called rank preserving structural failure time. And the basic idea of this is that you adjust the post-switch times to shrink them to remove the effect of the, of the switch treatment. So you split the patient's time into time off and time on experimental. And you, you multiply their time on experimental by some sort of treatment multiplier. And the key assumption here is that each cycle of treatment extends survival by a constant amount. In other words, this treatment multiplier is constant. It's the same over time. doesn't matter if you have your experimental treatment right at the start or right at the end. Um, the treatment effect is the same. It also relies on balanced arms due to randomization in, in the way it calculates that treatment effect. So the way that it works is that we're looking to balance this counterfactual survival time. That, point, survival time without experimental treatment. Um, you want to balance that between the two arms. You pick the treatment effect here that balances that between the two arms because due to randomization, if nobody had... Um, experimental treatment, this counterfactual survival time should be the same. Um, so it's time off it, treatment plus the time on treatment multiplied by the, the effect multiplier. And as I said, the core, the core assumption is that this treatment effect, this e to the psi, is, is constant over time. So you do need to define the two states of being. Is a patient on or off experimental treatment? And actually, that's, that's not as easy as it sounds because when these methods were first developed, they were done under the assumption that once a patient has started taking treatment, that treatment effect lasts forever until they die. Um, but actually, that may, that may not be very sensible if they're only taking treatment for a, a few cycles and then they're, they're living for a long time afterwards. So an alternative is to um, just say that the treatment effect lasts while the patient is receiving treatment. 
Um, so there, there's, there's those two options to pick between, and then, then there may be something in the middle that you can use as well. Um, the treatment effect is estimated in, in this procedure using G estimation, which is essentially a grid search of all the different values of psi that, that, that end up with, that give you your counterfactual survival times, and you pick the value of psi that gives you a balance in your counterfactual survival times between the two arms. And what a lot of people don't realize is that by doing this, you end up with a p-value that's similar to the ITT analysis. You don't actually gain any power from this. You may end up with a better hazard ratio, but your confidence interval widens because of the uncertainty in the estimate of psi. And actually, you don't, you don't end up really with a different p-value. Um, there is a more recent um, development that's recently been published which uses a weighted version of this puts more weight on earlier time points, so actually you can end up with a better p-value than the ITT in that, but uh, I haven't seen it used in anger um, in any health technology assessment yet. And this constant treatment effect assumption, you need to think about that carefully, because this is usually applied in oncology, and thinking it through, this may not be a particularly suitable thing for oncology drugs. I hope you probably can't read this at the back. Sorry, it's small writing. Um, but essentially, the constant treatment effect assumption is saying that if you take two patients, I've called them Bob and Steve, you can call them whatever you want to call them, um, and we assume that on the control arm, they would live for six months and they would progress after four months. And we give them both one cycle of treatment. Bob has his treatment right at the start, but Steve has his at four months after progression. And what the constant treatment effect assumption is saying is that both Bob and Steve would then have identical survival still, um, say seven months each. Even though Bob has his cycle of treatment right at the start, Steve has his after progression, it extends their life by the same amount. And in oncology, I think there's usually a general accepted wisdom that the treatment effect probably gets weaker after progression as, as a patient gets worse. Very quickly, talk about the third, um, the third method. Um, iterative parameter estimation is essentially the same as the last one I talked about, but just the key difference is that it uses a parametric model um, to get the estimate of psi rather than the G estimation procedure. And usually you end up there with very similar results. And the fourth and final complex method is called a two-stage accelerated failure time model. This is one that um, was brought up in, in the uh, technical support document, the nice technical support document that came out. And the way it works is that you, um, as well as switch time, you look at a patient's progression time and you define that as a secondary baseline and you treat the time before progression as the randomized study and then the time after progression is essentially an observational study. And you compare the switches to the non-switches on their post-progression survival. Um, but you adjust that for covariates that you measure at the time of progression. Um, so that requires that you need to collect quite decent data at the time of progression from patients so that you can, you can work out what it is that's different between the switch and non-switch patients. Um, so the core assumption with this is, again, no unmeasured confounders. You've got all of the variables here that predict switch and survival. Um, but it's slightly more complicated than for the IPCW because you, you're assuming that there's nothing going on in between progression and switch that may also have influenced that. Um, so it's a slightly stronger assumption here. So uh, an example to put this into perspective. Um, this is the sinitinib trial that I talked about at the beginning. And this was their intention to treat analysis. So they compared sinitinib to placebo. Um, at the end of the trial, the hazard ratio is 0.876, p-value of 0.306. Um, they'd had an interim analysis that had looked fantastic for overall survival. You know, really, I think the, the hazard ratio was 0.6 or something like that. And really, this is overall survival. So in the interim analysis, the survival looked really good. But at the final analysis, it sort of, it all come together again. And we've got 87% of patients crossing over in the final analysis whereas at the interim, there were a lot fewer patients that had crossed over. So this really seems to be suggesting there's something going on here. So they looked at various methods, naive methods, 
um, dropping switches. Yeah, the hazard ratio looks great, the p-value looks great, but if you think about it, 87% of patients switch, so that's only 13% of your population left to produce that. They looked at censoring switch and a time-dependent treatment covariates, and it's very mixed results, I think, so it's, it's difficult to decide um, which is the most meaningful, and we know that there's a lot of bias in these kinds of methods. So in the end, they decided to use rank-preserving rank structural failure time for their health technology assessment. Um, and the hazard ratio improved. It was previously 0.876, and now it's 0.505. Notice the p-value stays the same, because we don't get any um, additional power when we do this analysis. Um, but you can see now how the Kaplan-Meier has really separated a lot more. This is the adjusted placebo curve, um, and this is the unadjusted for switch. And it seemed to be a lot more consistent with the early interim analysis, which had looked good. So on the basis of this, this went into um, a submission to NICE, the UK HTA agency. And it actually, it tipped their um, cost effectiveness to be um, below the threshold that NICE deems acceptable. So they, were, they actually ended up getting approval um, on this, whereas without the adjustment, um, their cost effectiveness was probably a bit, um, a bit above the threshold of acceptability. And just very quickly, use of external data. A um, bit of a different approach here, but what you're looking at here is either, either validating your within trial adjustments that you've done um, using some external data or just using it, uh, just, just throwing out the control arm from, from your trial and replacing it with some external data. Um, it's a cross-trial comparison. It's, it's got fraught with all the same issues of cross-trial comparison. Important to try and get them as comparable as possible um, for that reason, I think it would be really nice if, if you're setting up a trial where you think there's going to be switching, you could set up at the same time an observational cohort study with similar characteristics and just look at what happens in that cohort where you don't allow switching. Um, but in, in real life, I think it's uh, a little bit um, much to ask for, trial, for companies to pay for an additional trial at the same time. Um, but that would be the ideal solution. Talking about method selection, so we've seen, we've seen there's, there's all these different methods. How do you know which one to use? Um, within the NICE guidance, there is a process outlined. Um, but I think, in general, it's best to think about it in terms of four steps. The first is, can the model be fitted with the available data? And I'll talk on the next slide about what kind of data you need for each of these. Assuming you can fit the model, you've got the data. Um, is it appropriate given the switching mechanism? So some of these methods, like um, IPCW and the two-stage method, they're not appropriate if you have more than 80% of patients switching. Because what you need, you need, you need a reasonable amount of switches and non-switches so you can pull out which covariates are causing the switch, what are your potential confounders. Um, if you don't have enough non-switch patients, then that estimation isn't going to be very good. Um, Assuming that those two are okay, are your assumptions reasonable? Um, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll outline the assumptions again in a couple of slides. And then, if all that's fine, are the results plausible? Again, we're looking at comparing to external data and perhaps um, asking expert clinical opinion about whether your switch-adjusted results make sense based on their knowledge. So the data collection requirements for the complex methods, this is really going from the least data collection required for the, the rank preserving and iterative parameter estimation methods up to the most which is required for IPCW. And I guess just a key point here is depending on when you're setting your trial up, depending on what assumptions you think are reasonable, you need to make sure that you collect this data or you can't use these methods. Often people try and apply them retrospectively and they're stuck with using this because they haven't collected covariate data at progression or until death or switch. Um, so it's just something to think about at the time of design. And then these are the assumptions, the key assumptions that you're making for each method. Um, if you're using ITT, you're essentially assuming that switch treatment has no effect at all. You're just happy to take the observed data to represent your treatment effect for your economic model. And the naive methods make an assumption that's really probably unlikely to hold. The complex methods have various different assumptions um, to be honest, you'll probably be in the situation where you don't really like any of these. 
But the point is, when you're doing an economic model, you need an estimate of treatment effect. You have to pick one of the bad bunch. And I like this quote, if you spend long enough on an island of one-eyed trolls, you'll eventually be able to decide which is the most beautiful. So you, 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 pick, you pick your most beautiful troll out of all of these and uh, put that in your model and, and then usually do sensitivity analyses, perhaps with a few of the others. So I'm done for time. Oh, right, okay. okay. I've got extra time, okay. <laughs> Um, so then just thinking a bit about best practice, so trial design, um, as I mentioned, these are often applied retrospectively, but if you do think switching is likely in your trial, do try and plan for it at the design stage. It helps to be really clear when you're doing this about what question you're trying to ask, um, what your rationale for adjusting for switches and who your customer is. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, if, if um, you've got switching that happens because your treatment is already available as a later line therapy. Um, that actually represents what happens in clinical practice, so you might not want to be adjusting for switch at all. Describe your intent to do the analyses in the protocol. It helps you then to um, justify to the investigators and patients why you want to collect all this extra data. Define what you mean by switch treatment. So is it just one particular drug? Is it all drugs in a class? Would you have any restrictions based on the dosing or the mode of administration for that? Think about that quite carefully. Um, and consider external data sources where you might get some additional information to validate your results. And obviously collect the data so you can do the analysis. And then when you're doing the analysis, I mentioned about pre-specification as far as possible. Um, Follow a transparent model selection process. Don't just pick the one that gives you the best result. I, I, no one here would do that. Um, but often the people that end up using this analysis are not statisticians and they're very tempted to cherry pick the ones that give them the best results. So any guidance that we can give them to, to steer them towards the more re robust results is, is useful. Naive methods probably shouldn't be your sole or primary method if you have any possible choice. Um, as I said, the IPCW and accelerated failure time models run into problems if you've got a lot of patients switching or if you've got, actually got a near-perfect predictor of switch as well. That causes problems. Our rank-preserving structural failure time model runs into problems if you've got um, similar exposure to experimental treatment in both arms or similar survival in both arms. If you've got similar exposure, then you don't have um, a unique solution to the equation, so you end up with multiple solutions. If you've got... Um, if you've got equal survival, then you're never going to move your hazard ratio far away from one, so there's actually no point in doing it. Always present the ITT, look at sensitivity analyses, and it helps to look at external data as well. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're actually using this to do some further extrapolation or modelling, um, you might have to think of some... It might, it might have further implications further down the line, depending on what method you've used. You can't just take the data... Um, and assume that that represents your individual patient data, you may have to take into account the additional uncertainty around your estimation. So a summary. So all of these methods are trolls, one-eyed trolls. None of them is universally best, but you may be able to select which is the most beautiful under your certain specific situation. Um, we've looked at some of the best practice. It's really important to be clear on the decision problem to collect the data and think about what you're going to do up front when you're designing the trial, if possible. But this is an area where there's a lot of further work and research needed, and there's a lot going on as well. Um, multiple switches are possible. Multiple switch treatments. Um, we could do some methods with some different or less strong assumptions. Um, and it may be, I think, possible to extend them to binary or continuous data. I don't see why that wouldn't be the case for at least some of the methods. And there is a bit of a lack of software for this as well. Um, there's a state of package that does the rank preserving structural failure time. And there's a few examples published for IPCW in SAS, for example. Um, but the, the G estimation procedure that's used in rank preserving structural failure time is not available in SAS. There has been, I'm aware of an R package that's been written, but as far as I know, it's not been released yet. So there's, there's a few gaps which at the moment, I think, are preventing the uptake of these methods more widely. I think with that, I'll stop and uh, questions.